You know, it's weird. It's uh, it's almost like in the mid 1900s, a bunch of corporations came out and uh, convinced us all that dry kibble is um, the healthiest thing for our dog, which is uh, you know, clearly not true. Um, you know, we we at Yum Wolf like our quickest success stories are always the ones where people switch off of dry kibble, usually recommended by their vet, unfortunately. But Hills, uh, you know, like maybe to name one of my least favorite brands. Yeah. You know, it, uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, first we just got to look at the ingredients, but what uh, a lot of people don't realize, and, and in fact, it even took me two years in the industry to really recognize, like a lot of us know that dry kibble is made through this hot extrusion cooking process. And we always talk about how it grinds all the nutrients down on, you know, on just like the, the smallest, you know, microscopic levels of the food. And it kind of like makes intuitive sense that like, okay, highly processed food is going to be really bad. But what it took me two years to really figure out why dogs who switch to pretty much any natural diet, fresh food, air dried, freeze dried, anything but dry kibble, like the a question could be, why is it that dogs switching off of dry kibble do so much better? And it occurred to me after two years that it's actually because this high heat that's used in the hot extrusion process and high pressure is oxidizing the fats, turning them into free radicals. And so, you know, if you just like anyone do a deep dive on, on free radicals, like there is uh, absolutely no debate that those are harmful molecules for any biological organ, uh, any biological being. So whether it be humans or dogs, those are going to be stealing electrons from cells in uh, in the body, ultimately causing faster aging, inflammation, um, all the bad things that we're trying to avoid. So, yeah, it's unfortunate that um, so many people are still feeding dry kibble, um, and it's even more unfortunate that so many people, when their dogs do have health issues, are being recommended it, uh, just because those are like, you know, maybe the the things that people have known about the longest and have been instructed to say oh, okay well if your dog is uh, having digestive issues here's the digestive formula that uh, we can put your your dog on and and also this medicine you know there's there's a much simpler way and one one thing that I always um, kind of comment to people that I speak to is you can take the even if those ingredients were good which in hills particularly they're not. But there are lots of other brands uh, of dry kibble that have reasonably okay ingredients. Um, you can take those same ingredients, put them into a more fresh diet that is more minimally processed, avoid the grinding of the nutrients, avoid the oxidation of fats. Um, this is like really where my book starts. Um, you know, we really talk about like why that problem is so fundamental. So I, I really agree with you in what you said about we got to start with the foundation, like rounding out the top people, you know, we do have uh, like supplements for these things, but I always tell pet parents, those are going to help. Like those are like five to 10% improvements. But if we don't get to the bottom of it, the foundational nutrition diet, that's like, nothing's really going to get better until we address that. So yeah, nutrition is super important. Um, you know, I think like I became passionate about uh, health and nutrition for both humans and dogs when I learned that all of my skin allergies uh, were actually food allergies and doctors had been uh, prescribing me, you know, worse and worse corticosteroids and stuff like that, which work for a little bit until they don't. And then your symptoms come back 10 times worse and you need mm -hmm. even, you know, more and more intense uh, remedies. So once I learned that I personally just need to not eat certain foods, eggs, nuts, and seeds in my case, and I'm totally fine. That like really opened my eyes. So I ended up doing this deep dive of 3000 clinical studies that, um, tied, uh, in particular when it came to canines, it tied certain ingredients to, uh, health outcomes in dogs, particularly I focus on microbiome diversity, which is uh, you know, a very new uh, area of science that interests me a lot because the more and more we learn about the microbiome, it's like guiding our whole body, um, you know, like 95% of serotonin in the body, for instance, is uh, in the microbiome. So when people talk about just like little things like that, it's like, okay, well, serotonin, you know, matters in the brain, 
but like where is the majority of it? It's actually in the gut. So more and more research we're finding uh, really shows that microbiome diversity as like a biomarker for health is uh, unanimously linked to longevity, lower disease, uh, even things like diabetes and, and obesity, which are inflammatory um, uh, type of health conditions. A lot of people don't realize that. All those things are, uh, you know, tied back to the microbiome and and the ingredients that we're putting in our or our dog's body. Really glad you brought up the high heat processing because that really is one of the biggest problems with uh, just the standard kibble diet, um, as you said. And I I also wanted to go back to something else you mentioned at the beginning. Um, when you are getting into and trying to figure out what what really is the issue, what really is the problem, and it it sparked a memory for me not too long ago. I was talking to Dr. Kathy Alanovi, and um, she we were kind of just discussing the similarities in our our practices because she gave up her license so that she could actually practice the way she wanted to practice and actually help patients to heal and thrive. Whereas, you know, in standard traditional veterinary medicine, like they, they have to follow these check boxes and you can't do or say these things. And it kind of went back to, she was like, I, or I was talking about how I, I, for a lot of my clients, I feel this like obligation to provide them with recipes that are balanced to AFCO standards. And not necessarily a hundred percent of my clients, because there are certainly people out there who are more well-versed in holistic health and follow all of the holistic veterinarians and understand that um, balance can come through rotation, which is actually how we achieve it in the wild and all the things. But for the, a lot of my clients, I'm like, how do we achieve balance? You know, I have to, I have to give them AFCO balanced recipes. And she's like, but why do you think that? Who told you that? And I'm like, I don't know, me, maybe, I guess. And she's like, you know who told you that? AFCO told you that, right? Like it's AFCO that put all these standards out that all of these states have adopted that, and they have just done such a good job at like brainwashing us that every meal that our pets eat have to be completely balanced to this set of standards that they, this one organization came up with. It's so crazy. And I just wanted to say that. I don't know why I wanted to say that. <laughs> no, I totally feel you. And uh, there there are a couple of interesting things there. First off, uh, you know, definitely no hate to AFCO. All of our recipes are, are uh, complete and balanced for all life stages, yeah. uh, according to AFCO dog food nutrient profiles. But, you know, there are a few things that I've learned that um, really might kind of hint that like those feeding guidelines aren't necessarily super science backed. Um, mm -hmm. First off, if you look at a lot of the uh, like vitamin D levels and stuff like that, um, not saying those are right or wrong, but they're usually based off of uh, one study that was done in the 1960s on 20 beagles. And uh, we saw that like Dogs who had under a certain level had a certain health outcome and dogs who had above that level had another health outcome. So we just said, okay, well, good enough. Um, we're going to like put this as the minimum standard and really no further research was probably done on that. And that, you know, it, it, it just shows that, um, you know, these aren't necessarily like really hardcore science backing these levels. The second thing here is uh, there there are things like minimum vitamin C requirements uh, that like start to make this really controversial because dogs actually don't need any vitamin C in their diet. They can synthesize 100% of the vitamin C that they need on their own without eating any outside vitamin C whatsoever. And the problem with this is that when you actually feed vitamin C to a dog, um, the way that it works molecularly in the in their body is it actually binds to calcium and it's it pulls calcium out of the bones. So it can actually cause um, like bone problems and and other you know related health issues just because we're feeding vitamin C. And that's not even getting into the different types of vitamin C. You know, you're gonna see like you know, really synthetic forms in a lot of dog food. Um, 
another thing that uh, I've been starting to talk about a lot, and it's kind of like my current area of research, it, because I, I've like really gotten on the bandwagon of synthetic vitamins and minerals aren't ideal for our dogs. And the reason that I believe that is because all of these studies, uh, really new ones especially, are starting to show that, you know, wh whether it's vitamin D or it's um, different, different types of uh, like vitamin, you know, A, you name it. Also minerals. Um, I won't go into all of them right now, but like all these different studies are being done right now. And they show that like the body in both humans and dogs doesn't view uh, those synthetic versions the same way as like that same vitamin that's coming from like, you know, organ meat or something like that. And so mm -hmm. there's, there's something there. People are talking about this a little bit in skincare, which obviously has nothing to do with pet health really, but, um, but the same thing, like when you look at actually like plant-based, um, plant-based topicals versus like animal-based topicals, um, they actually have different molecular shapes and, and the animal-based ones absorb in the skin. So like the skin mm -hmm. uh, it is like very similar to organs in a lot of way. Like it, they're all just like the it's skin is an organ. organ. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it, exactly. And so I think it's like a, a sign in addition to like lots and lots of studies that are showing the same thing in, you know, the kidneys and the heart and yeah. um, okay. the liver. I'm going to stop you there because I do want to talk more about synthetic ingredients, um, as especially as it relates to the new product that you have coming out, because you just said, you know, this is something that you you've recently become very passionate about. I do want to talk about it. I'm passionate about it as well. I I just switched to a tallow face cream. Oh, so nice. like I get it. Um, so yeah, it is absolutely that. And I just wanted to kind of interject that it is absolutely, even though we think, okay, human skincare has nothing to do with animals, but especially as a pet health coach, it actually is something I have to take into consideration because a lot of women, for instance, will use topical like estrogens and that can have an effect if it gets on your pet. Like it actually can have an effect on them because yeah. it's topical. You're putting it on your skin and then you're going and petting your dog, let's say, and your dog may, may just be really, really sensitive to these changes and fluctuations and hormones because, you know, all of our, basically all of our pets are spayed and neutered and um, that in itself is we're realizing causing more problems than <laughs> we ever could have imagined um, with their endocrine systems and their hormones going out of whack. 